What's up, what's up, baby? Welcome to another edition of uh, Master Moats. Going into this classroom. Obviously, we're going to recap some of these Steelers versus Bills plays. First one we're going to talk about is the uh, third quarter interception that Devlin Duck Hodges threw to Tredavious White. And we're going to talk about the negative of it, but we're also going to talk about something that was very positive in this play. So you know how we do. We'll play at full speed one time for you, let you see it. Then after that, we'll break it down. Doug, Stradavius, obviously. See, so bringing a little bit of pressure. The interception. Check out the big man. All righty. So we'll start it out. <clears throat> First, we'll talk about what's the coverage. All right, so we see initially still starting on a two by two set, meaning you got your two receivers here. Got your two receivers or receiver and tight end over here. So it's a balanced formation. Back is offset to the right. Now, initially, you're looking at this coverage and you're seeing it has a too high shell. So just off the top of your head, if you're a pre-snap, just from a pre-snap standpoint, you're thinking it could be cover two because you have the split safeties going there, there. It could be cover four, meaning he would have vertical, he would have vertical, he would have vertical, he would have vertical. Or you could do a cover six, which would have him... Uh, being a vertical, him being a vertical, him being a half field player, and him staying low. So those are some of the things that you're thinking pre-snap just off of this alignment. Now, as we play, as we play the play, a couple things happen. So we bring the motion. <clears throat> motion is a big indicator for zone versus man. So the reason why we're knowing this zone right now is these two guys bump over. But you notice this corner never runs. So if this corner is going to run with him, then you would think more man principles. But that's not the case. So we're thinking zone. All right. And we're seeing this guy starting to build, right? So right now, what do we know? Right now, we know it's a blitz coming from the corner, from the boundary corner at that. All right. So if you're the quarterback, you know your clock has to speed up a little bit because you didn't see any of these D linemen bail out. So it's not a simulated pressure. It's a real pressure, meaning they got five guys coming. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so if they got five guys up here, just simple math means you're going to be short on the back end in terms of your amount of guys. So with typically when you have a corner blitz, you're thinking fire zone coverage. And if it's fire zone coverage, typically the way it works is this defender would be seen flat off for number two, which means you would have them vertical or out. The inside linebacker right here, Tremaine Edmonds, would be off of number three, which is the running back. So he would have him anywhere in the middle of the field. If he goes out, then he switches with this outside guy who I've seen flat. And then this, uh, I think it's their other linebacker or nickel corner. I wasn't really sure. But he's going to be seen flat off of this number two. So that's initially what you're thinking. And obviously, he has this deep third over here. He has the middle of the field between the hashes. And then he's going to have this other deep third on this backside. So that's the initial thought process. But now let's play and see what happens after that. So now, right here, a big indicator lets you know one thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. These guys aren't playing a traditional seam flat or fire zone concept. They're using more cover three principles behind this uh, corner blitz. So the biggest difference is this. The way we know they're playing cover three principles and not fire zone principles, this guy's shoulders flat. I mean, are square to the quarterback. This guy, he's starting to uh, relate to number three, but he's not jumping on him right now. Odds are still in the backfield. This is the big indicator right here. Shoulders square. If he was a seam flat defender, if this was fire zone coverage, he's having to run with this. He would, he would have his back turned right now running with, I think this is Tevin Jones. He'll be running with Tevin Jones right now. But he doesn't. His eyes are right here. He's flat. So that lets you know right now this is a true cover three concept behind it. And this is why when we're talking about the throw for Devlin, this is what he's thinking. If it's seen flat and this guy's running with him, well, now it's a great anticip he's anticipating this throw because at the NFL, you can't wait till you see the guy open. You have to throw the ball and just know that he's going to make his break at the right place. He's going to get there, and he's ultimately going to make it happen once the ball is there. So, priest not. I mean, so in this moment right here, if this guy's back is turned, this is the throw you make because you know this corner is off. 
in a cover three, or excuse me, in a fire zone coverage, when that same flat defender is gone, the out is there because this guy has to respect the vertical. Now, in this situation, with it being just a traditional cover three, not a fire zone concept, a traditional cover three, this is a tough throw to make because you got this guy underneath as your curl flat defender. So his job is to take away any being 12 and under. That's that's what he's trying to take away. But really, he's really want body position on this deep out, which is what uh, Deontay is running. So now with Duck, he has to put this ball perfect. He has to sit it over top of this guy's head, but also not too far so Davis can't make a play on it. And you want to make sure it's on the outside part of the receiver's body. So that way he's catching it on the sideline, not inside hit where the defender has a chance to break on the ball. So as we play it, you see his body position, right? Right there. This is why this is a tough throw. Because you have him underneath, so you have to air like we just talked about. But ball position. If it's on this shoulder, Deontay is catching it as he's running this way. Running to the sideline, he catches it. He can either turn up or catch it, run out of bounds. Tre Davis can't make a play on it. Now, ball placement being on the inside hip, now Tre Davis is able to break flat down, step right in front of it, which is what he does. And now we have the issue. So, just off that ball placement, when you're seeing Deontay have to reach back like that, this right here where he's reaching back with his uh his right his uh Deontay's right arm having to reach back, that lets you know ball placement is bad right here. Now Duck has been doing a good job with his touch. He's been doing a good job in terms of some of his reads, but this was one of his pretty bad throws that uh that Sunday night game. If it's on this side, Tre Davis can't get to it. But like I said, this is a tough throw because of first off, he's far hash. Throwing it to the deep out. That's one of the throws that they always talk about at the combine and at pro days because it's truly a judge of your arm strength. So that gives you the opportunity to see, can you rifle that ball over there without this defender being able to get to it? On this particular play, Duck did not do a good job of that. But the thing that I was extremely proud to see, once this ball is intercepted, this guy right here, Matt Filer, I believe he's what, 6'4", 6'5", close to 300 pounds, watch his effort. I'm going to play this one in full speed for you. Just watch his effort. Watch the big man run. Watch him go get Trey Davis. And let's be real. <clears throat> Under any day of the week, Matt Fowler is not even close to fast or even close to fast enough to run with Trey Davis White. But the things that he decided to do was this. He understood the angle. He understood, I have to run at this angle. It's going to give me the best chance to cut him off at the point. The second thing is this. <clears throat> a lot of times, fans will look at a play, and you see an interception. You say, well, he's not going to get to him. He doesn't have a chance. Why chase after him? He's being smart, saving his energy. The reason why you run like that every play is because you don't know what can happen. You don't know. He might trip. He might have to cut back. He might stumble. Anything could happen. And if you're not running your full speed, if you contemplate whether or not you want to take off or not, if Matt decides, hey, I don't know if I want to run as soon as it's caught and then decides to go, he doesn't make that play. And why was that critical at this moment in the game? Because if Tredavious scores, they go up two scores, and that changes everything. But by him chasing him down, making that stop, ultimately that led to the Steelers having two opportunities at the end of the game on two separate possessions to have a chance to tie the game up, all because of Matt's effort. Now, that's what we like to call a championship effort. That's what we like to call the, the effort of just true winners because he doesn't think about it. Watch, he's going right now. As soon as the ball's caught, he's going right now. And like I said, I don't want to play him in slow motion because, you know, he deserved to look fast. So I'm going to make sure I play it regular speed for that man because he earned it. But just look at that, man. You love that. You see Duck. You see Pouncey. Jalen. You just, you never know what can happen. You never know what can happen right here. If this guy blocks him, you see Jalen Samuels chasing. You see Duck going. You see Pouncey going. And these are the things these are the signs of winning teams right here because, like you said, anything can happen. And if you aren't displaying this type of effort, and this is Duck after a negative play. This is Pouncey after an interception. Ow. 
all these guys right here, if you don't display that type of effort, you will never have a chance to win in this league. So shout out to those guys for that, man. And Duck, please learn. Don't make that throw, baby. All right. So now we're going to go to the second play, which is the uh, TJ Watt forced fumble of Devin Singletary. And shout out to TJ, man. Just got named to another Pro Bowl um, defensive player of the year candidate, front runner in my book. Of course, I'm not biased, maybe just a little bit, but I mean, just watch his, just watch how my man goes to work right here, man. So this is him walking out right here. It's nice little cover six. So he's in coverage. Force fumble. All right. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. All right. So first off, <clears throat> Stills are playing a cover six coverage right here, so Joe's gonna be deep. I believe this is uh let me see who this is. This might be Edmonds right here. I gotta check. But yeah, he's gonna be deep as well. And then I think this is Mika right here on the back side. He's gonna have that deep half. This looks like Nelson, he'll be squat corner. Alright, so in this particular in this particular defense, TJ is showing off the edge initially, but just off of your a feel for the snap count, a feel for what's going on, he's going to walk out on number two and show because you never want a number two receiver uncovered. They can just run down on a safety like that. That's a never. You never want that to happen in this dollar defense. But in this particular defense, we'll play it a little bit further so you can see him walk out on number two. So yeah, in this particular defense, TJ is going to have the number two receiver. He's going to have him pretty much uh, out in until he gets to number three if these two guys switch up then Devin and TJ work together or if this guy's going vertical TJ's job is to reroute him and then excuse me after he reroutes him then the safety will take over but from a from a post snap standpoint once the ball is snapped his job is to stay flat footed get hands on this guy either for any route he's running but also if it's a run play he's able to get back into the action so we'll play it for a little bit. So we see TJ right now. Eyes go back to his number two. Because he doesn't know right initially if it's a run or a pass. But now he's getting hands on him and makes light work of Cole Beasley. But this is the beautiful part right here. Right there. TJ could easily go make the tackle. And a lot of players would just go for the secure play, which is the tackle. You wrap him up, two hands is over. But TJ being the game-changing player that he is, the impactful player that he is, he doesn't want to just settle for the okay play or the good play. He wants to make the great play. And he sees right now with Devin Singletary, he's a rookie, who struggled with ball security. Ball's in the outside hand, but he's not protecting it with two hands. And TJ sees that. And TJ being the player he is, he goes and punches at it. Beautiful execution to punch that ball out, force that fumble at a critical junction in the game too, because they were driving. You see where the ball is right now. They were pretty much in the Steelers uh, 30 area close to the red zone and a touchdown there would, would have broke the back of the Steelers. But like I said, <clears throat> TJ being the guy that he is understands the significance, understands the opportunities that arise and knows when to take those chances. And that's what he did. And it was a beautiful play by him. Like I said, goes through his fundamentals. He doesn't run out of there right away. He's honoring his guy just in case they tried to do a play action pass or anything like that. He was still going to be in position to guard, uh, to guard Cole Beasley. But then <laughs> something that we always talk about here in Pittsburgh, whenever they have a wide receiver trying to block you, it shouldn't be close. You should ragdoll him because if wide receivers are blocking linebackers, it's probably time to get new linebackers, baby. That's just the rule of thumb here in Pittsburgh. So like I said, you see him just make light work of Cole Beasley, eyes where they need to be, and gets right back in the action. And you just see him dialing it up, dialing it up, dialing it up. Bam. Ball out. And that's been one of the things that he's been able to do a ton this year in terms of creating turnovers. Something that this defense has been able to do a ton of. And like you said, it's these type of plays that separate him from everyone else. Because you can have an impact as a pass rusher, and that'd be one thing. But he's doing it 
as a pass rusher. He's doing it in coverage. You saw him with the interception last week versus the Cardinals. And now here he is forcing a fumble at a critical point in the game versus the Buffalo Bills. And this is when he was in pass coverage, coming off of that block and then going to make a play. So, man, big kudos to TJ. And, uh, yeah, man, definitely appreciate y'all for tuning in. Watch the play one more time at full speed. Let's all just enjoy TJ's greatness. See the priest not communication, letting him know I'm gone. I'm helping you. I'm working with you, Devin. Bam. Ball out. Good job by Mike Hilton, man, recovering that fumble. And there you go, TJ. Get your dance on, TJ. Get your dance on. 